Thank you very much to Kansas University for inviting me and to the Center for Russian and East European Studies for allowing me to present on this. Um, I'm not a Russian Orthodox Church specialist, but certainly the role of Nikolai, uh, who was metropolitan, uh, similar perhaps to a cardinal's role in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, has always intrigued me. And because uh, they use, the Orthodox Church uses, all hierarchs are monastic, they use monastic names. And so there's a bunch of Nikolais running around, there's a bunch of Sergeis and Alexeis, and you're trying to go, whoops, who's he? So I finally decided to kind of chronicle Nikolai's life. And there was a definite collaboration of the Orthodox Church in the disinformation campaign of the Soviet government about the Katyn massacre. So I saw one hand lifted. Let me just understand. Who does not know the timeline of Katyn? So I'll do that in three minutes flat. Anybody want to raise their hand or everybody's sort of familiar? You don't know the timeline of Katyn. Okay. Soviet Union signs the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact with Germany, August 1939, September 1st. There's a secret codicil with a map showing how Poland will be divided. Germany invades September 1st. Soviet Union invades from the east on September 17th. They function as allies of the Germans for almost two years. In that time period, they take a number of POWs. Most of the rank and file are released. Officers, educated people, police, ETC, ETC are retained, and then they are killed. Um, they are killed in the period of April and May 1940. Their families have been receiving correspondence from them, and then the correspondence ceases and desists. There's a question about whether Germany knew about the massacre before it occurred. There were three meetings, at least three meetings, of the Gestapo and the NKVD. They took place in Poland in, within the confines of the old borders, meaning one of them took place in Brzezcz, not Bugiem. How much discussion there was between these two parties is unknown. How much the Germans knew before the fall of 1942 is not known. It's reasonably clear that the Germans knew by the fall of 1942 about the massacre. At the point that they announced it in April of 1943, the Soviet Union immediately alleged that, of course we didn't commit the crime, it was the Germans who committed the crime. And so a propaganda campaign began. And Nikolai was part of that. So I have never done it this way, so you're going to have to forgive me because I'm not sure uh, how this is going to work. So as I said, uh, in order to move up in the Orthodox Church, you've got to take monastic orders, which he does. And he's an archimandrite at the Holy Trinity Lavra, very early, 1919. He's still a very young man at that point. He becomes the Bishop of Petrhol, and he's appointed by Patriarch Tikon, who is the last patriarch elected before the revolution. He is actually Patriarch of Moscow, and he, as you can see, as the statement is, he declares the Bolshevik Revolution anathema. He is, of course, arrested. When he is arrested, uh, he leaves a letter and says, there are three men that you can elect to replace me, one of these three. And a metropolitan named Peter is elected. The church in Russia went into an amazing schism at that point. Not only did you have the Starobyrtsa or old believers, the Hliste, um, and any number of other subdivisions of the church, does everybody know who the old believers are? Hands up. Okay, I got a corner that's blank here. Uh, old believers broke away from the church 
in about the 17th century, late 17th century, when you go from making the sign of the cross with two fingers to three fingers, when you spell Jesus' name in a different form, and some other uh, items. They go completely underground. They are old believers who are popovtsi, which means they still have priests. They accept priests who are um, ordained by the standard Orthodox Church and who come over to them. And then there's another group of old believers that says, no way, Jose, these guys are all invalid and they operate through today without priests, without Orthodox priests. But after the revolution, you have a different split. You have the catacomb church goes completely underground. And as P P Professor Fletcher wrote in his book, um, they continue to exist way, way down the pike into the 60s and 70s. When people would be coming out <coughs> from the Soviet Union and reporting on this, Americans were kind of shaking their hands, heads and saying, no, that's not possible. But later documentation came out from the Soviet Union itself, which confirmed that they were existing. It was the Renovationist or Living Church. This was a group that broke away and immediately accepted the Bolsheviks and had no problem dealing with them. And you'll find out in a minute why I'm talking about all of this. You had this true Orthodox Church, as it referred to itself. And then you had all of the Russians who were living outside of Russia proper, and they formed Rokor, or the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia, which continues to exist. And you have Rokor in the United States. Fletcher says that we should have refrained from moral judgment and interpret all these actions solely from the perspective of their contribution to securing the survival of the church and the Soviet state. And this is the position of the Moscow Patriarchy. And it's important to talk about this because the way the Moscow Patriarchy is currently discussing Nikolai, they are attesting to the fact Kirill and the new head of the exarchy are both attesting to the fact that the church would not have survived had Nikolai not been around to handle matters. Um, clearly, I am of a position that you can't, the ends do not justify the means. You cannot uh, go into a collaboration with a government that wants to destroy your church and say that they are excellent and wonderful. Now, Nikolai is a prisoner between 1922, I'm sorry, I forgot to enter that, and 1926. Some people say it's Uskolom, some say it's Solovki. Solovki was a place where everybody who was religious was being shipped off to, male, not female, so females were handled differently. He's released in 1926. And I think that, that at that point, he has agreed to collaborate with the Soviet government. Um, he approaches Father Kierneveau, and that those records I found at the Assumptionists General House in Rome in March of this year. And he wants the Orthodox Church to combine, join forces, unite with the Roman Catholic Church. It's not clear whether he expected the Roman Catholic Church that existed in the Soviet Union to submit to the Orthodox, to the um, living church, the Renovationist Church, or whether they're going to come under the Roman Catholics. But my understanding, my reasoning rather, is that he would want the Roman Catholic Church in the Soviet Union to subject itself to the Living Church, the Renovationist Orthodox Church. Father Pierneville goes, hmm, okay, and that discussion ends. Um, let me just defer or, or make a comment. Father Pierneville was pastor of St. Louis de France, which was a Roman Catholic parish started in the early 19th century by the French who had escaped the revolution. Uh, the Assumptionist Fathers, or the Augustinians of the Assumption, were the priests who were assigned to that parish. In the 20s, Father Pierre Neveau 
was still there. He did have an assistant, but there were only two of them. There were a couple of Polish parishes also in Moscow at that time. There was um, a Jesuit parish in Leningrad, and of course Odessans, and in Western Russia, where you had large groups of Polish people still living there, you had a number of Polish parishes uh, and uh, Roman Catholic priests there who were consistently arrested. And if you'd ever like to read about that, Father Professor Roman Zwankowski wrote a book cataloging all of them. So he goes and he meets with the pastor of this parish. Nothing happens. And then he renounces the renovationist church. He returns to orthodoxy, beats his chest, says ma culpa, and he is part of them. And why is this important? And who can read the Polish? Partia wiodącą siłą narodu. That in 1927, Stalin is in power. Metropolitan uh, Sergei, Metropolitan Sergei Nikolai and Nikolai Klementev, uh, they come and they meet with Stalin. And they say, the party leads the nation and we accept it. Essentially, they accept the same position that the renovationist or living church took. They're partly concerned that also all of their property is being confiscated by the government and handed over to the renovationist and or living church. And Stalin accepts this. And then as you see, there's a document printed in the press in which Sergei discusses this. Now, Sergei is functioning as head of the church at that time. Remember, Tikhon was imprisoned. They appointed Peter after Tikhon is dead. And then Peter is arrested, and he's sitting off in the gulag. Boris Talantov comments that Pope Pius protested the persecution of Christians, not just Roman Catholics, but Christians in the Soviet Union. And Sergei defends the Soviet government. <clears throat> he came out with a declaration that there was no persecution at all against believers and their organizations in the Soviet Union, and that there never had been any. Now, in the meantime, people are being shipped off to Solovki, and they aren't just your petty criminals. They're, in fact, your priests. In 1927, Nikolai is sent to Petersburg because a great schism occurs at that point. It is called Sergianism. After Sergei and after that acceptance of the Soviets, the Bolsheviks. And Metropolitan Joseph in Leningrad is very well known. They're mostly called the Josephites. That was the largest group. But there were about three or four other smaller groups of people who protested Sergianism. And essentially, their statement, in fact, even today, there are Orthodox uh, scholars who write, not in the Moscow Patriarchate, of course, that when Sergei declared or took this position, he made a pact with the devil. That having done that, he was not only not or, no longer a metropolitan, he was no longer a priest that all Orthodox priests ordained coming out of the line of Sergei were not priests. They did not have um, the canonical lineage back to Peter. And so this is a huge schism. Nikolai goes to Leningrad, tells them, OK, guys, you got to get back on the boat. you got to get back with the Orthodox Church, with Sergei. And when they say no, he interdicts not only the Metropolitan, but remaining priests who support him. And he becomes the administrator of that diocese. You couldn't have become an administrator of the diocese or a Metropolitan or any other function unless the Bolsheviks approved of you. And this is being done with their full knowledge and understanding. And now he's elevated to the rank of Archbishop. And between 1936, he's also the administrator and then Archbishop of Novgorod, Skovs, and Lenin. And then the war starts. And this is where Nikolai very clearly is functioning 
There is no excuse for what he does. The church in Ukraine was autocephalous, an independent church. When they take over uh, Ukraine, uh, rather Eastern Poland, Western Ukraine, they declare that church to be an exarchy. And he is exarchal patriarch and, uh, of, and archbishop as well of Lutsk and Volyn. Then he takes over Western Ukraine and Belarus. The Autosophilus Church is liquidated. And in February of 1941, he goes to Lvov. Uniates, who are Greek Catholics, in other words, they observe the Eastern Rite. If you walk into their church, it looks just like an Orthodox church. They recognize, however, the Pope as their authority. Um, there are theories that state that the Uniates were created because Poland wanted to control the church in Ukraine. You're going back to the 16th century. There are other theories that state that this was a way to allow the Ukrainians to have a de facto Orthodox church that was not subject to Moscow to operate somewhat independently. When the Soviets take over, they force, imagine, the MKVD is standing there and forcing you to renounce your faith, not permanently, but to accept orthodoxy. Uniate priests who refused to convert, as well as Uniates, were executed, and not in nice ways. And there are reports that Nikolai was present at these executions, which would not be very in line with being uh, part of a loving church. And he is then Metropolitan of Kiev and Galicia as of the 15th of July. However, what happened on June 22nd, 1941? Anybody want to speak up? No voices? Barbarossa. Operation Barbarossa. Germany's invaded Russia. Nikolai is no longer in <clears throat> Kiev. He's been evacuated to Moscow. He receives the title literally after he gets to Moscow. Moscow is evacuated. As you realize or know from your history, the city is almost about to be taken over. All the religious figures, the remaining couple of rabbis, couple of pastors, and um, the local tenants, patriarch, are evacuated to Ulyanovsk. Two people do not leave, Metropolitan Nikolai and Father Mar Marie Leopold Brown. Father Mar Marie Leopold Brown came to Moscow in 1934 when the United States reinitiated diplomatic relations with Bolshevik Russia. There was a separate codicil to that agreement that stated that a, a Catholic priest shall be assigned to serve the needs of the U.S. Embassy. And it was determined that since Father Brown, or reverse, it was determined that since the Assumptionists were running the parish of St. Louis de Francais, it would be best to assign a priest from the Assumptionist order. And luckily, the Assumptionists have a province in the United States. Father Brown was bilingual. Uh, he could help serve the French community, the French-speaking community, and he could help serve the Americans. Father Brown did not leave Moscow. One of the reasons he does not leave Moscow is because his church, standing directly opposite Lubyanka, is broken into five times in the winter of 1940 and 41. And it's desecrated the first four times. The fifth time, they steal the chalices, the patents, the monstrances, everything. And then the government says, oh, that was state property, and you didn't protect it correctly. So now you have to pay us for the value of these items. So he doesn't want to leave Moscow because he doesn't know what else they're going to steal from him. And there are these only two people that are religious in Moscow. And basically, Nikolai is constantly in contact with the government. 
He is officially named the deputy of the law lieutenants. <coughs> Fletcher writes about him as being the eminence grise of, of the patriarchy. This is from 1927 when, when Sergei said, Patia This is the first time that the name of a religious figure appears in the press. It's a celebration of the Bolshevik Revolution, and he signs that document. He is also, in November, appointed to the Mother Commission of the commission that investigated Katting. There was an overseeing commission, and they were, as you see, damage inflicted by them on citizens, collective farms, social organizations, and so on. If you read about their uh, studies, you will discover that the members of the commission themselves did not visit all of the sites where subcommissions were working. There were other people appointed to serve on those commissions. Therefore, it's highly exceptional that basically all of the members of the Mother Commission were also members of the commission to investigate the Katting massacre, which of course, in its title, the commission already stated that it was committed by the German fascist invaders. And so again, his name appears in the press. Easter service in Moscow. It's filmed. These films are broadcast. They're viewed. This is done for the Western allies to convince them that religion operates freely. But it's also done to convince the Soviet population that the church is functioning. It is not the patriarch who's brought back to Moscow. It is Nikolai who conducts the service. Nikolai, I cannot find a record of Nikolai ever having met with a Roman Catholic after that one time when he met with Father Pio Novo. And just to clarify, I spoke about Father Brown being in the parish. And I said he came in in 1934. In 1936, Father Novo says, you know, I haven't been to France in 12 years. I want to go see my family. I'd like to do some things, maybe get medical care. And he leaves. He has promised that an entry visa will be issued to him in France. Da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. I think you know what happens. He doesn't get an entry visa. They never refuse it to him. When he dies in 1945 or 46, they do issue the visa two days after he dies. <laughs> so no one could ever say that he was refused a visa. And of course, they know he's dead. The Pan-Slavic Conference, the third Pan-Slavic Conference, meets on May 18th, or at least on that date. Uh, Nikolai is speaking to the Pan-Slavic Conference. Now again, this is done to emphasize the role of the church. Clearly, Stalin is going to be taking over Bulgaria. He's going to need to take over that church and incorporate it into the Moscow patriarchy. He's going to need to or want to take over the Romanian church and so on and so forth. So it's very functional for Nikolai to be there and speak. Remember, the Germans have announced Katyn on April 13th. On April 28th, the, Medi the International Medical Commission has issued its protocol stating that based on physical changes in the bodies, in the cranium, and other factors, it's clear that these murders occurred three years ago. They could not have occurred 18 months ago. What does Nikolai say? We will prove that it was the Germans. In 1941, there was a book issued called The Truth About Religion in Russia. For wartime conditions, it's a luxury edition. Paper is slick paper, the kind you have in books that have photography today. Um, the photographs are pasted in. How many of you have seen old books where photographs are not printed on the page, but they're actually pasted in? That's luxury work. It requires additional labor. Uh, it is bicolored. There is a little red decoration at the top of each chapter, and the first words are in red. Whenever they quote Patriarch Tikon or anybody like the local tenants, they start out with gold letters. 
granted it's gold paint, it isn't 24 karat gold lettering, but still, for wartime conditions, this is really luxury. Large type, big margins, the cover is not a simple cardboard cover, it's faux leather, padded faux leather. The book is issued, you can't buy it. If you want to buy it, you have to go in and register at the Society for Atheism, which is the publisher of the book, <laughs> and explain why you want to buy the book. The official price is 30 rubles, the actual price is 100 rubles. And Father Brown describes this, because he decides to go get a copy of the book, and he gets a beret, and wears a black coat so that he looks like a Spanish radical, and he speaks Spanish, and he comes in and he, quiero un libro. What happens? Nikolai heads off to Kuybyshev. What is Kuybyshev? That's where all the diplomats have been, and the government has been transferred to. And the embassies are actually living in hotels and functioning in hotels. And Nikolai shows up there, and the press secretary of the British Embassy says, he came in and was not clerically attired. He came in with another person, I don't know who it was. He went up to his room, and when he descended, he was attired clerically. And he gives them the book. Not one copy, but something like 70. And then says that he's already shipped 700 of these books to London. And that he wants the book to be printed in London, or in England, in English. The British, you know, are somewhat befuddled. Lawrence also states, they must have trusted him very much because they allowed him to stay in the same hotel with us. In communist times, when foreigners came to the Soviet Union, they were allowed to stay in certain hotels. Soviet citizens and even citizens of uh, the Warsaw Pact nations stayed in other hotels. So he's really trusted. He gets to stay in the same hotel. And what happens? Lawrence reports on this to London, and the Foreign Office is talking about what do we do, how do we handle this? And it is the fall of 1942. Now we'll fast forward to September 4th, 1943, a year later. Lieutenant Sergei, Alexis, and Nikolai come in, meet with Stalin and Molotov. And Sergei says, we would like to hold a synod. We haven't had a synod. We need to elect a patriarch. And Stalin, in his wisdom, says, and how shall this patriarch be titled? And it's Nikolai. It's recorded that it was Nikolai. It says, he shall be called patriarch of Moscow and all Russia. Shekh Russia. Or as Kirill now calls it, Metarosia. And Stalin says, fine. September 4th. And Stalin says, when do you want to hold this meeting? And they say, well, you know, three weeks. And he says, I think we can do this faster. It's so wartime. How long does it take to get to Moscow? Well, air transport is military. Trains take a week to 10 days. Half these guys are probably still sitting on Solovki or in another gulag, and you need to feed them up a little so they look like a human being. So yeah, three weeks. Guess what? That's, by the by, what Nikolai would walk around wearing, sometimes in gray, sometimes in black, with this funny little shaped hat. Um, four days later. There's no record of this, I believe that that meeting of September 4th was simply a pro forma performance. That plans for the meeting were conducted way ahead, that these guys had to have been hauled out of the gulag and were being held off stage in the green room and being prepared for the synod. So there's only 19 people who were free who could come and vote. 
And then what happens? September 19th, the Archbishop of York visits the meeting. Remember, we were talking about 1942, the fall of 42, the meeting with Lawrence, and here we are, York. York is in communication with the Foreign Office. The Foreign Office has decided that it shouldn't be the Archbishop of Canterbury, but it should be the Archbishop of York that will go. And they've been prepping him, literally sentence by sentence, word by word, how he should be phrasing things. There's correspondence in the British Public Office records on this matter. And he comes in. So it took him a year to prep for this meeting, and I think they, as I said, released the Metropolitans much earlier. And the English language edition of the truth about religion in Russia appears at that time in England. And here you have this kind of poor quality paper, tiny print, narrow margins, small spaces, monocolored, uh, low pixel images printed in the text of the book, totally different from what was printed in Moscow. Deeply moved by the sympathetic attitude of our national hero and head of the Soviet government. Express to the government our council's sincere gratitude and joyful conviction. We will redouble our share of work. This is the patriarch speaking about the government that has killed thousands. Not just believers, but priests, monks, nuns. And in January of 1944, so we've had the fall of 43. The Russians have reoccupied the Smolensk region in, in the fall of 43. They send in a special group. You've got to prep the site. And in January of 44, the extraordinary state commission for ascertaining blah, 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 the German fascist invaders perpetrated on the Polish officers in the Katyn Forest was created. And basically, all of the members of the mother committee were members of this subcommittee or subcommission. The Bordenko Commission, as it was called, because one of the significant members of it was academician Nikolai Bordenko, a surgeon who was well known, uh, met in Katyn at the massacre site on January 24th, 1944. It was a performance prepared for the Western journalists who came there. There were 18 journalists. And the group also included Kathleen Harriman, Kathy or Katie Harriman, the daughter of the ambassador, and John Melby, third secretary of the embassy. And on January 24th, they issued their statement about Katyn, which was that, of course, the Germans had perpetrated the crime. Interestingly enough, when the Poles came to Katyn, that first group that came was brought by the Germans on April 9th, there was a priest among them, a kanonik, a canon from Kraków. And he offered prayers at the gravesite. Nikolai was there. There was no record of him saying one prayer for the repose of the souls of the dead. And on January 28th, he receives the Medal for the Defense of Moscow. Uh, Sergei, who had been elected, died very rapidly. And Fletcher had written that, in fact, there was discussion before the election of 1943 of whether or not Nikolai would become or should become patriarch. But it was decided that he would function much better in the role of an Eninan Skris, um, handling things in the background. So I'm kind of going to be closing down because I know I'm running over my time limit. We will fast forward. Nikolai, when the church creates a organization called the Commission for the Exarchy, in other words, for all of the churches outside of Russia, Nikolai heads that group. There is then a group created called the World Peace Council. It's a Soviet front group in Vienna. It actually doesn't have a real address or anything. But Nikolai not only becomes a member of it, he is secretary of the group. 
and he consistently speaks, mind you, even in his sermons, he speaks about the evils of uh, the West and how they are bombing and how they are poisoning people in Korea and in China and so on and so forth. Most um, priests tended to avoid those kind of overtly political statements. His career continues until around 1960 when Khrushchev has initiated in the interim his program once again of liquidating the churches. There is some sort of conflict between Nikolai and Khrushchev. He is removed from his function as head of the exarch. He, he is removed from the council of the exarchy. He is also removed from participating in the World Peace Council. He is sent off. The church immediately kowtows. They remove him from his function as Metropolitan of Kruzitsa, and they send him off to some dorky little city. And Nikolai's health suddenly collapses. He is hospitalized. His family is not allowed to visit him. Nobody who knows him is allowed to visit him. And then he dies very shortly afterwards. Granted, he's in his early 70s. He's not a spring chicken. But even so, it's surprising that nobody was allowed to visit him. There are statements in the press, the Orthodox press, that the uh, the Western Orthodox press, meaning Rokor, that he has been eliminated by church functionaries, that he was po poisoned. Or that he was eliminated by the NKVD. That's not clear. However, what is clear is, I think, based on the whole timeline of everything that's happened, that Nikolai did work in close collaboration with the Soviet government. He never would have questioned anything that was said about Katyn. The Orthodox Church never took a position to attempt to have the truth about Katyn said. It was only very recently that it did when the, when the cemetery for the Polish officers was created there. And then immediately afterwards, when Kirill came to that service, Kirill then announced, we need to build a church in Kati. And why do we need to build a church in Kati? Well, this was a massacre site where Soviet citizens had been massacred between 35 and 38 as well, in other portions of the forest. And so we have to honor those people. So this massive church has been built, and its purpose is to deflect attention from the massacre of the Polish officers in the forest. From the speeches of Kirill and Nikolai, uh, who's the new head of the Exarchy, I would expect that within the next two years we'll have an announcement that Nikolai Yaroshevich is one of the new martyrs and is a saint of the Russian Orthodox Church. Rokor in the United States, or throughout the world, went through a process in 2005-2006 where they were attempting to consolidate with the Moscow Patriarchy. Uh, certain segments of Rokor split away at that point. So we have a new schism in 2007. There is Rokor NP, in other words, that part of the church outside of Russia that has subjugated itself to the Moscow Patriarchy. And you have Rokor A, which is not just America, but it's other countries as well, who are saying, until the Moscow Patriarchy deals with what it did during all of these years, it cannot legitimately carry the mantle of being the Patriarchy of the Russian Orthodox Church. And I think those words help confirm what I've been trying to present to you. And I thank you for your attention, and I hope I allowed you to learn something new.